Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. It's so nice to see so many uh, friends of the library here, so many past friends. So uh, good afternoon. I'm Dean. I'm Scott Seaman, Dean of Libraries here at Ohio University. I'd like to welcome you to this edition of Authors at Alden. Today, we have Dr. Huawei Lee being interviewed by President Charles Ping. Um, two prominently, prominent, internationally known uh, individuals and personal friends. They both have a long tenure here at Ohio University. The library owes a great deal to both of these two men. Under the encouragement and guidance of Dr. Ping, Huawei was instrumental in the development of the libraries as an esteemed, internationally connected institution, as well as earning the library's membership into the prestigious Association of Research Libraries in 1996. And there are only 100 members in North America of the ARL. This event is being held in honor of Huawei's biography, The Sage in the Cathedral of Books, which shares the story of his life from his childhood through a nearly 40-year career in the field of librarianship, especially international librarianship, between the United States and China. His career was marked by many successes as recognized by the Melville Dewey Award, which was awarded by the Association of, or the uh, American Library Association in 2015, and an honorary doctorate from Ohio University in 2012. This book is published by the Ohio University Press. It is written by Yang Yang, who is with us tonight, who has journeyed from Beijing, China. The English translation, which is available to you today, was translated by Ying Zheng. <laughs> she has traveled from Irvine, California, uh, where she is research librarian for Asian studies at the University of California. Both Yang Yang and Ying Zheng will join us for the question and answer session that will follow immediately after the interview. Before, though, I turn the, the microphones over to uh, Dr. Ping and Huawei, I have two things. First, little professor is right over there <laughs> selling <laughs> <laughs> copies of this very book. I encourage you to do that. Also, there is a reception immediately following this talk on the third floor in the faculty commons. And there's light refreshments. And Huawei has agreed to sign books. So thank you very much for coming. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I've been reminded, please turn cell phones uh, to mute. <laughs> Thank you so much. And Dr. Ping, I will turn this over to you now. Well, well we uh, somehow seems fitting that we should gather to this, have this conversation while they're working on the roof of the library. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like perpetual. <laughs> well, I, I'm delighted to have this chance, and uh, I'm sure everyone knows her, but let me introduce your wife, Mary, uh, <laughs> who graces me. <laughs> and when I saw the lineup of children and grandchildren for the pictures, I decided I haven't gone and leave that alone. <laughs> <laughs> That's in your hands if you would introduce the children that are here. Should I do it now? Yeah. Okay, I'm very pleased to introduce part of my family. We have six children, four of them are here. Our oldest daughter, Sherry. <laughs> Our second one, Jim. Our third one, Pamela, and her partner, and their uh, best. Yeah. And then our number six, Bob, and his wife, Kara. And also Bob, two, two boys, 
here. Ah. <laughs> Just stand up. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you have two monuments to a remarkable career. This library and the Library of Congress, Asian Division. And uh, that's really a lifetime of achievement. Let's start by talking about the book itself. Thank you. Uh, what was the occasion of it being published? Where, why, when? What went on? Okay, I was approached back in 1993 when one of our sister libraries in China, the Chinese Academy of Science, the regional libraries in Wuhan, the library director once asked me, are you writing your biography? I said, no. <laughs> she said, why not? I said, I'm not that kind of special person. I always hate to write about myself. So a few months later, and he, he sent it to Ohio University, a library intern. It's a writer. After the arrival of this librarian, and she told me my assignments to come here for as a library intern is to write your biography. So I said, well, that's fine. So he did a lot of interviews, took a lot of pictures, and took a lot of my materials. But after six months, she decided not to go back to China. She decided to go to California and find a Chinese newspaper and become a reporter for the Chinese new newspaper in San Francisco. So the project ended. So when I about to retire from the Library of Congress, 2007, on one of my trips to Beijing, I saw Yang Yang and her husband, Paul, and Zika, she bought. Both of them, I know them very well because Yang Yang was here for three years, got two master degrees. During the two years, she worked at least two years in my office as my student assistant. Her job was helping me to receive the library interns from many countries to arrange their living accommodations, to take care of them. So Yang Yang did such a good job. So when I saw Yang Yang in 2007, Yang Yang said, how's your biography? I said, nothing happened. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, Yang Yang said, could I do the, write your biography? I said, Yang Yang, if you want to do it, fine, but it's going to be a, <laughs> a tough job. Yang Yang said, I don't mind. I like to do that. So that was the beginning of this biography. And Yang Yang did spend about two years. And in fact, we didn't set a deadline to complete the writing of this biography because I was not in any hurry to get this biography published. But in the year 2011, actually 2010, several of our sister libraries in China, the, the, uh, the national Zhongshan University in Guangzhou, Shenzhen Library in Shenzhen, and also the Guangdong Provincial State Library. The directors, they got together. They like to have a, some kind of seminar in honor of me for my 80th birthday. So I said, that's very nice of them. Uh, initially, I tried to decline, but they said they insist to do it. So I went ahead, and then they want to publish as part of the symposium, collect work of my writings. So I gave them a lot of my materials. They eventually compiled, published a two volume set of Huawei Li's work. And then in addition to that, and Dr. Chen of the National Zhongshan University asked me, it would be nice to have a biography to go along with the publication of your work. So I told them Yang Yang was doing it. She said, about finishing? I said, not yet. So, I, so she got the phone and called Yang Yang. She said, Yang Yang, we're going to do this symposium at the end of the year. You better finish up. <laughs> <laughs> so Yang Yang, poor girl, <laughs> with the two children, with a full-time job, she worked very, very hard.
for six months and finished online, on time. So by the end of uh, 2011, when the symposium was held, we have uh, my published uh, collected work and Yan Yang's biography. So that was the way that came about. And then the, a, a new edition published in Taiwan. The reason, the, the Chinese edition, and uh, because of censorship, so they took out some sensitive part from the biography. So my friends in Taiwan learned about it. Say, we're going to publish in Taiwan. We're going to publish the whole thing. <laughs> so the Taiwan edition came out in 2014. And then Ning Zhang, very nice. He also was a library intern here in uh, 1983. 89. 89, 89 sorry. <laughs> 1998, and uh, Ying works very, very hard in the uh, University of California, Irvine, offered to do the translation. That's a quite a job to translate from Chinese to English, especially Yan Yan looks so well, beautiful Chinese. So you try to translate them as beautiful as they are in English was not an easy job, and he did it. And then I will also want to thank so many people here, <laughs> that the uh, thing Scott Seaman and Kat and uh, also um, Mason and her staff, they all helped to edit the final edition. So we are very fortunate to have the publication here today. Uh, There's a long story. <laughs> so it's uh, no, it's a, it's a great story. And this is obviously then the third time the book has been published. Uh, and both in the depth of your research and in the beauty of your translation, uh, we're grateful. All right, the, uh, the book, the, the biography starts in a little unusual way. Instead of going back to the start of a life, it actually begins with the most recent event. And the most recent event that's recounted in here is a grand retirement party at the Asian Division of the Library of Congress. And the Librarian of Congress came and spoke in glowing terms of Dr. Lee and then uh, Dr. Markham, who oversaw two thirds of the 4,000 people who work in the Library of Congress spoke. And let me read just a few sentences from what he said so that you can grasp the magnitude of what uh, Huawei accomplished there. Uh, Dr. Markham said, uh, you know very well, or you know better than anyone else, how badly you were needed when the library recruited you they had the Asian division. Collections were unavailable to the public. Now, what goes to the library that that's true? <laughs> Bibliographical records were not in the online catalog. Staff relations and morale were in disrepair. That's an understatement. Then skipping, there's almost no comparison of today's Asian division to the one you inherited. The recognition has removed, uh, the reorganization has removed the language-based independent units. The staff works harmoniously and productively. The collections are well organized and can be served to the public. You have raised the public profile of the Asian division with your seminars and the formation of a friends group. Sounds familiar. <laughs> we have partnership with countless libraries in all parts of Asia. Well, this was a grand occasion. And I know it was wonderful. <laughs> you were very pleased and honored. Now, the first three chapters deal with uh, 
your childhood. And the central reality of it is war. First the Japanese, and then the civil war in China. Uh, what are your strongest memories from those years? They were very difficult years. I think the things mo I remember most, especially now, watch TV, see the bombing in Syria, people escaping the f houses or destroyed. That was very much the, the memory I had during my childhood. In the morning, when we hear the third siren, we had to run out the house to the countryside, and then we saw the airplane flew over, they keep bombing. Luckily, you don't get a hit, but a lot of people got killed. By the time we came back, your house maybe not there anymore. So those are the memories I had during my childhood. And then throughout my schooling, elementary school, and part of secondary school, and uh, we had to change school every few months because we had to keep moving, running away from the war. So we studied a month or two, we moved to another place, enrolled in the school temporary, and then we moved to another place. So this kind of dis disruption in my schooling, I remember <laughs> very vividly. And you were actually retreating from the advances of the Japanese. That's right, yes. Uh, it was, must have been a very tough childhood. Very tough. Not enough to eat. I always feel I, I was hungry all the time. <laughs> you had uh, a very close relationship with your older brother. Yes. Uh, he went in the Air Force and he chose the name Min, which means not afraid to die, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, he lived uh, an exciting life. He was sent to the U.S. for part of his training, and then he came back. And uh, among his exploits is that he somehow borrowed a plane and flew to China and transported your whole family to Taiwan uh, as the movement from mainland to Taiwan began. Uh, He was a lieutenant colonel at 31, if I remember the book right, right. and uh, was a hotshot pilot, and uh, sadly was lost uh, flying a spy flight uh, for our forces over southern China. And only 30 some years later, were you able to actually identify the site where your brother was buried? And you were instrumental with others in bringing back to Taiwan the ashes of your brother to be buried with full military honors. Would you like to say anything about your Well, yeah, that was a very unfortunate event the time he was killed was 1959, May 28, 29. That was the time Mary and I, we just got married a few months, couple months, and we were looking forward to our graduation to receive our first master, master degree in education. We got this bad news. At first, the Chi Taiwan government tried to not make the family too sad about this. So they just told the family the airplane was missing. They may be arrested or hiding someplace. But eventually, I was able to find from the newspaper publishing Hong Kong. They showed the airplane was crashed, mentioned the place, the name of uh, the mountain. So after 30 years, three, two years, I left China in 1949. The first time we went back to China, 1982. So I had the newspaper in my pocket. I went back to Guangzhou, Guangdong province, tried to look for where if I can find the burial place. I find the mountain. 
a huge mountain, huge, almost impossible to find out where the body was built, was buried. And I tried to ask the local officials. None of them want to say anything because they're afraid the government don't allow them. So I waited another 10 years. I keep going back, trying the relationship later on was improved between Taiwan and China. So I finally got a permission from the Chinese government, say, please help this guy to locate his brother's remain in such and such place. So the lo local government official finally very willing to help me. So we find a place we were able to recover the remains and cremate it and took the ash back to Taiwan. So unfortunately, when I went back to China first time, 1982, my mother and father begged me, Huawei, one of the things you had to do, try to find your brother's burial place. But when I find 1992, both of my parents already passed away. But at least I did what they, want, they asked me to do. Yeah. And the, the family was really more at peace with that. Yeah. All right, we're going to, if we're going to get through, we're going to run. Today. <laughs> Skipping <laughs> ahead to uh, your years on Taiwan. Yes. You finished uh, your undergraduate degree at the National Taiwan Normal University. Uh, and you were appointed a joint a junior staff person. Uh, and America beckoned, uh, well, no, there's really another whole story. Uh, you met Mary, and you courted her. <laughs> uh, and according to the narrative of the book, you were completely unaware of American dating customs. <laughs> uh, and uh, somehow you managed to start dating her next year, proposed to her, and very shortly after that, we're married. Uh, there are a lot of things that you got out of coming to America, but surely <laughs> that's the most precious. And he was now a graduate school, in graduate school at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, curiously, I'm a year older than you are, uh, I was a graduate student at the same time. Right. And I was the resident head of the Graduate Center at Duke. That was the center that housed all the men who lived on, single men who lived on campus. There weren't any women in the professional schools, I'm sorry to say. Uh, that was a different era. And uh, among the duties assigned to me was that I was to identify all the international students in the 400 group uh, in the building uh, and try to find uh, ways to help them get settled and acclimate to the American culture. And uh, I know well the difficulties you faced because I counseled with students and worked with them in that era. But uh, I'm curious, as you look back on your movement from Taiwan to Pitt, what were your real challenges as a graduate student? Well, there were a few major challenges. I think the first one is the language barrier. I knew very little English at then as a graduate student, even though I passed English qualification exams before I left Taiwan. The second one is the adjustment to a, a different culture. The third one is a financial mm. worry. You don't have enough money. You don't always worry about what's the next, next week, next month. But one thing I had to say, I was, at all, I was able to overcome many of the difficulties, owing to my dear wife, Mary, I had to tell them how we met. In, at my first class, 
graduate class in the United States at Pittsburgh, the cathedral learning on the 27th floor, I remember, because of being a new student, not speaking much English. So I tried to hide way back in the classroom, hoping the professor won't see me or ask me any questions. And Mary came in a couple minutes late, so she just sat next to me. So by the end of class, the professor came over to me. She said, Huawei, I understand you are a new international student. And do you have a problem to understand my lecture? I said, I do, but I try to take notes. I'll go back to study my notes. She said, could I look at your notes? I said, yes. So I showed him my notes, all in Chinese, <laughs> with a few <laughs> English there. So the professor turned over to Mary. She said, Mary, this gentleman may need your help. You take a good note. Would you mind lending him your notes? Mary was very generous. She gave me her notes. So I took home, I copied them, I memorized them. So that's the way we became, get to know each other. And she was most helpful and, uh, to overcome many of the barriers I had initially. But many of us understand some of these things. Uh, but I don't think many understand what language means. Uh, in the five years I was the housemaster of the Graduate Center, there were five students who committed suicide. Uh, most of them were because they had been absolutely the top student in their class. And they got here, and suddenly this German student was trying to keep up in terms of quantities of reading and papers to be written in a second language. And uh, this was traumatic uh, beyond measure. But you may not have been aware of the culture, but as I said earlier, you certainly did well in a hurry in courtship. <laughs> uh, before we leave the Pitt Library, uh, as I read the story of your life, this was an important moment in your life. Uh, the, the Pitt Librarian called you in and she informed you that you had been chosen for a new program library trainees and I guess asked you would you be interested and you accepted the appointment and this was really a move you were in the graduate school in education but now suddenly you were a graduate student in library studies and uh, you had to pursue a Master of Library Studies as a graduate degree, as a condition of this. I, I read this as a turning moment in your life. Yeah, yeah very true, because uh, my second year, because I, I want to be financially independent. So I went to, I use the library a lot. So I knew many librarians. So I asked them, could I apply for a job as a student assistant. I was accepted. So I worked in the stack and shelving books. That time, the library was still closed stack. The faculty student cannot go into the stack. So we, are the, as a student assistant, we had to run into the stack to find a book. So that was the beginning. However, because maybe I did a good job. So the librarians offered me to become a a librarian trainee for two years. And uh, they pay me full time, doing, working full time, go to library school part time. And they promised me if I get my library degree, I never become a full time librarian. I thought it was a good opportunity. I actually got to like the library work after first year, shelving books, running around the stacks. I thought that's a good profession to begin with. So when I was offered the opportunity, I accepted it, which I never regret. <laughs> well, there's another parallel. I worked in the library as a graduate student as well. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> about the same time. Uh, but you're too modest. The, the librarian at Pitt said you were specifically chosen because you had tried to help people. You've ever been in a library with closed stacks? You're trying to do research, it's a real pain because you, you can't really gather the books that you need. And uh, you went out of your way to help the patrons as they came to use the library to see related material and uh, your thoughtfulness impressed her. Yeah, because I was a graduate student myself. I knew how much time it takes to find the things you need. So when I get a request from a student or faculty member looking for a particular item, I go in the stack, I see there are several other things close to the topic of interest to this student. So I just bring, instead of one book, I bring three books. It turned out the books I select for the student were better than the ones uh, <laughs> he was asking for. So they load the suggestion in the slip in the suggestion box. Hey, so and so, the way he does should be encouraged. Every library staff should do that. So the director got the, the notes, thought that maybe I was a good one to become a librarian. So offer me the opportunity. Uh, that thoughtfulness <laughs> marked your whole career. Thank you. And uh, its presence here at this turning point to library science uh, is very descriptive. Thank you. Before I leave this, oh, I'd like to uh, introduce a subject. I was struck by the number of women in prominent positions in the libraries, like the Pitt Librarian, uh, now, this was not true of universities generally. You know, there weren't very many women as deans. There weren't any women as deans would be the more descriptive statement. And there were not many women presidents. The world has turned. Some of it has changed, at least. And a majority of the presidents of the Ivy League schools a few years ago were women. But library science seemed to have a strong representation of women early. Why? I think they are better librarians, perhaps, than men. <laughs> I don't know, because they are more interested in helping the patrons. And uh, I was very lucky. I have my three first three jobs, P University of Pittsburgh Library, Duquesne University, Edinburgh State, and all the library directors were women, and they were just wonderful boss. But the thing did change. Now you can see maybe 60% the key positions in the library held by women, and then other 40% by men. That was quite a change from the years I started my library career. Uh, yeah, another question that uh, Claire and I, my wife and I, shared our graduate year. In fact, her mother was convinced I was never going to be gainfully employed. <laughs> and you and Mary shared the graduate experience. The two of you got a first master's degree together. And then she supported you in whatever way she could. Uh, as children began to come along and you were married and in graduate school and sharing it. Uh, what do you think about this sharing as a married student, a graduate experience? Mary is an unusual woman. She not just supporting me, helping me, but also she raised a wonderful family. I really had to say, give all the credit to her. Mary, would you like to say something? Nothing changes. <laughs> well, uh, I uh, was impressed by the fact that 
you made a series of stops along the way in the next few years, roughly three years in each, because you, I don't think it's a reason, but you'd heard in a commencement address someone say that you ought not to stay longer than three years in your career early, and uh, you took it to heart. Uh, <laughs> But you went first to Duquesne, and uh, then you went from there to one of the uh, regional state colleges that were in the process of becoming mm -hmm. a state university, Edinburgh. And you were faced with building a new library. I mean, physically, a building. And uh, you had to f jump into something that proved to be very productive in your career. I, I was very grateful. There are many opportunities to advance my library information knowledge and experience, Edinburgh, Duquesne University, and later on in Bangkok, Thailand, gave me a lot of opportunity to learn, to grow professionally. But I'd put it a little stronger than that. It seems to me that each stop along the way, uh, as I read, you, you acquired a skill uh, that uh, proved to be very fruitful in your years here and your years at the Library of Congress. My years here, I had to give my special appreciation to you because uh, Dr. Ping was the one who hired me and gave me the entire support and the trust at the time, there was really a lot of work needed to be done. We saw the kind of support from the top positions was not as easy. Although, I had to say, I was so lucky to work with a wonderful group, my colleagues in the library. They all want to try to make the Ohio University Library the best library resources in the country. So they all try to work very, very hard. So I'm just a lucky person. Well. And we were, too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I want to talk more about that in a minute, but uh, let's talk about your experience in Thailand. Uh, the three-year cycles stopped with a stay in Thailand. Now, as I read the book, uh, I was a little uh, surprised According to the book, a commencement speaker at Edinburgh, a uh, State Department representative came full of enthusiasm about a new project, a multinationally supported library, technical library, in, in Bangkok. Now, it was all planning and thinking at that point, but apparently over lunch, he... Uh, was so full of it that he sold it to you and uh, he, he turned to the president and the president granted you a year's leave of absence to begin to start to help in this project. Did it really happen that quickly? He did because the speaker was invited by him, was a good friend of him. He's a senior official from the State Department and he described international education, the importance of international education, and this project in Bangkok. So and upon learning my experience, my position was a librarian. So she turned to the professor. I didn't ask. He turned to the professor. Could I borrow you, Mr. <laughs> Lee, <laughs> for this job in Bangkok for one year, get this thing started? The president couldn't say no. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so unfortunately, when I went to Bangkok, the project is really much more than one year can accomplish. So I had to quit the job at Edinburgh and stay in Thailand for seven years, which they proved my wife because all our family enjoy our stay in Thailand. Well, I, I'm sure that would make a whole other story. <laughs> and Mary moved all the children and everything all the way to Bangkok. And, uh, well. Yeah, we got an offer. Uh, in June, I was interviewed by Colorado State University on behalf of the State Department 
And then we were in Bangkok in August. Two months. <laughs> yeah. Well, tell us about the Asian Institute of Technology. Uh, a little bit about its mission, what your role was, and what you think it added to your uh, library and leadership. Yeah, during the seven year we were in Bangkok, that was during the Vietnam War. The United States and other countries participate in this AIT project. We we'll try to build something for the post-war period to reconstruct the region. And they need a lot of engineers, technical people. But at a time, Asian countries have two problems. One is the brain drain. They have so many bright young people graduate from college. They came to the Western countries to study. They never returned. So they, they lost all the talent people. They call the brain drain. Another problem is the brain waste. For those few return to their country, they find out what they learned in the West was not practical. They cannot apply them in their home country. So they can so discuss. So AIT was set up for the purpose to train Asian engineers working on the Asian projects while they're in school. When they graduate, they can take on a job with their government for one of the Asian infrastructure construction projects. So that was the AIT's purpose. And did it, in fact, achieve this then? Yeah, they, 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 the uh, AI, Asian Institute Technology is still there and still doing very well. It's a graduate school. Well, it was, uh, you, you, the, the, the campus didn't exist. The program didn't exist. Everybody was talking, but uh, an awful lot of work had to be done. Yeah, it's a very important in experience because you're working with, uh, uh, there are about 13 countries participate in this project. We have 13 from the United States, 13 from Great Britain, we have about 11, 10 from Japan, and everyone work together harmoniously and, uh, to, to, to build this. So we didn't have a campus, we borrow a building from Chula Lunko University for three years until we build our new campus. But once our new campus was built, there was a first class university building in Asia. So many visitors every day come to see. That was a quite an interesting experience. The, uh, uh, this was a period when Mary was, uh, you had five children right. when you went and uh, six was born <laughs> at the <laughs> uh, uh, military <laughs> hospital there uh, in Bangkok. Uh, and they had, uh, you said, 24 seven uh, access to a swimming pool and uh, you know the median temperature is about 90 degrees in <laughs> Bangkok and she had just come from Edinburgh which is the snow belt of <laughs> Pennsylvania to hear this tropical wonder uh, a, a city of utter chaos in terms of traffic uh, and you built the new Asian Institute of Management out from the town. Yes, we, uh, the Thai government gave a piece of land. It's about 20 miles from Bangkok, which was nice. And then the, we just built a whole campus uh, uh, at that site. It was a very just ideal place for the new institution. All right, the funding uh, began to erode after seven years. Yeah, after the Vietnam War, the project, U the United States support for the project end. So we, we, we left the AIT. But the, at the present time, I understand the American government continue to provide scholarship to the Asian intra technology. The, the usual pattern on these projects, we've been involved in a number of them here is that the project is assigned to a university and it provides leadership for uh, the choosing of staff and so forth. 
I, uh, after seven years in your Thailand assignment, and the funding began to end, and uh, uh, you accepted an offer from Colorado State University, and you went there as associate director of libraries, and now the Lee family moved from tropical Bangkok <laughs> <laughs> to western Colorado, which if you know your geography is the snow uh, center of uh, Colorado and of course all the children had to learn winter sports now <laughs> and uh, that meant endless changes of clothes for Mary and uh, whole new experiences for the family. But there's an interesting quote from the book. Uh, I think it was a comment uh, made by someone as you were leaving the Asian Institute of Management because of the way you have been able to draw Chinese universities and universities throughout Southeast Asia into a cooperative use of this. The uh, comment was made, he had turned into a uniquely international librarian. Hi, when I read your thesis uh, way back then, and I remember interviewing you, it was this as part of your background that was very important to us. Uh, you did bring modern library management techniques that you had gained uh, as you experimented with the use of the computer and other things. Uh, but you're credited with introducing libraries to modern management techniques. Now, what's involved in that? Well, um, at the time, the, the library has had gone through very rapid change in management style. I think I remember starting from management by objective, and then we went to participatory management, making library administration more transparent. And then we went through this uh, total quality management, make sure our service with the user is our primar primary the, uh, service of ob uh, the target. And then we went through the knowledge management, upgrading the library's level from data management, information management, to a higher level of knowledge man management in Western. Uh, Western. Well, uh, you describe it in a few sentences, but <laughs> this, yeah, it's also true that what it represented was that the library, libraries were changing more in these few years of your career than they had changed in the previous 600 years. That's correct. Now, many would, all right, you're, you're here now. <laughs> uh, many would insist that your crowning achievement, uh, and I was leading the cheers, uh, was to achieve membership in the Association of Research Libraries. Uh, I, for some reason, they declared a three-year hiatus, right. so it didn't actually happen during my years as president, but immediately after it, uh, much to my regret. Uh, but in any case, we made it. Uh, what were the strategic changes that you introduced to make us uh, qualified for it? The qualification to be considered by, for membership at, at the Association of Research Libraries, they involve two major areas. One is the size of your collection, the qual quantitative kind of things, including how many staff, how much uh, annual budget, and uh, how, how many books you add to your collection, how many serial titles, those are the quantitative things. That's easy, even though we still have a gap to catch during the years I was here. 
But another one is the qualitative requirements. Are you a good research library? What are the research collections qualify you to be an outstanding research library? Associate research library, they try to limit their membership to 120 altogether. So they already had 120. So unless someone drop it out, become disqualified, uh -huh. and then we get a chance to be considered to, to be a the member of. So it took us, I project that time was 15 years. Actually, we reached the criteria just about 15 years, but because they have a, 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 a the freezing of accepting membership for three years, so we three more years before we were invited to become a member. Now, uh, my memory may be wrong, but it seems to me we push for membership uh, earlier and were right. told by them, that is the officials at the association, very annoyingly that while we were cataloging and, and growing at a rate that more than qualified us, and while the number of books being checked out and the uh, mm -hmm. use of the library generally um, was clearly better than the expectations you were doing it all with too few people to qualify. <laughs> and they just didn't believe you, well, uh, I guess. They limit to 120. But you cannot just meet the criteria of the 120s library. You had to be getting to the 70s of the 120 library before you can be accepted. So we really try very hard. And we exceed what their expect expectations and the, when we were invited, they were so happy to invite us. So that was one was your leadership, your support, even though that was happened after your retirement. But the, during your years, that was what those most critical years for us to reach the goal. Well, it was, uh, we added two yeah. characteristics. Yeah. One, we were categorized in the Carnegie categorization classification as a research library, I mean, a research university. university right. And then we made this step and were classified uh, in that very ex uh, prestigious group, uh, Association of Research Libraries. And, uh, I rejoiced in that. Uh, one of my many proud moments as president was uh, a recurring event during trips to China and visiting Chinese universities. Every campus I went to, uh, there would be a group of librarians waiting on me who wanted to formally thank me for what you were doing through the library internship program. Uh, and it was a, a marvelous program and I'm sure was of great and lasting importance in China. Uh, why don't you tell the group a little bit about what that program was? Yeah, after the Cultural Revolution, the Chinese educational system including the library, were totally destroyed. So after the Cultural Revolution, China had a hard time to catch up. They were 20 years, 30 years behind the development level of American libraries. So at the time, I was very lucky to have the opportunity to serve as a consultant, advisor, sponsored by many international organizations to go to China to do lectures here, there, and also start our internship program to welcome a librarian from China and other Asian countries. And that particular, I think the two things were most needed by the Chinese libraries. And they actually doing quite well. Originally, I thought it would take them 20 years, 30 years to catch up. In 10 years time, they reached the level which we consider 
at an international acceptable level of development. Well, they were deeply grateful. And as I said, this theme was repeated over and over again. In fact, I have uh, usually it involved an exchange of gifts. And I have a lovely carved Buddha uh, <laughs> that was a gift from one group of librarians on my bookshelf at home. Hi. Right. Each, I, I, I wrote this and I, I want to read it because it's important to me. Each of your three year stops and your seven year stay in Thailand contributed to the development, your development and understanding of librarianship. Uh, we are most grateful for the 21 years that you gave us. The one constant to all of this is connectedness. Uh, your crowning achievement in my mind was this connectedness. You drew the libraries of the state of Ohio together and connected them so you could search all the libraries. You opened connections and ties uh, that spread across the country and around the globe. And it was this search for relations, this connecting of people and institutions that I think is your crowning achievement. Well, resource sharing was one of major focus for most libraries, including starting from Ohio to nationwide to internationally. The resource sharing like OCLC on a nation world basis. Ohio Link is a sort of for college university libraries in Ohio. Those are the connections you mentioned, very, very important for library to enhance their service to their patrons. Now, some of this is familiar to me and to many in the audience. Well, what is OCLC? Okay. OCLC started, well, I had to go back a little bit more. The Library Congress in the 1960s, they started the computerized cataloging, they creating a format for library to follow, using this format to catalog your materials by computer. They call mark format, machine readable catalog. So OCLC, the Library of Congress started, and the OCLC tried to take advantage of these records. So started forming, original was for Ohio State University libraries, and then expanded to others. Try to using the Library of Congress machine readable cataloging information, and they add on our own cataloging information so everybody can share using these resources without going to do duplicate work. Before OCLC, if you buy a book, everybody buy a book, every library had a catalog. That's a waste of a lot of manpower. With OCLC, if what, whoever the library, the first one catalog it, book, everybody can use the record. So that's the kind of and connectivities, that's and time graduate, saving. Yeah, right. Graduate students here could right. find out what was available at other places. Right. The Ohio Link is a statewide. It's enabled 80 some college university libraries in Ohio. The faculties and students can use any of the collections of any of the libraries within 48 hours turnaround time. So that's really a major improvement during the year that the Ohio Link was born. Correct, Scott? <laughs> Things changed so much, I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, you hope it's continuing to grow and expand. But y you, you don't appreciate what this means until you look back to your years as a graduate student. I remember doing my research, I had to visit a half a dozen university libraries looking for material on the 19th century philosopher that I was working on. Because I couldn't find them without <laughs> actually physically going to the libraries. 
I yes. remember this area when I first came, full of a car catalog. If people are looking for a book, you go to the car catalog, you find your material, write down in the car, and then you give the circulation desk, they will give you the book. Now we were happy that we replaced car catalog. I remember one interesting, when I tried to remove the car catalog, replace it by computer, I remember two very distinguished professors <laughs> standing in front of the car catalog. Say, Huawei, you cannot move this without moving over my dead body. <laughs> so I started a project, try to have all staff reference that particularly, try to conduct workshops for faculty members, how to use a computerized catalog. And after a few months, I find the two professors very happy using the keyboard, <laughs> typing in. They say, Huawei, I like it. <laughs> that makes me feel so happy. <laughs> well, let me skip over a lot of things to the last question. Okay. Uh, the other monument is a refurbished collection uh, at the Library of Congress. Uh, in, first of all, you retired from here. You had a brief period of relative peace. You're never still. Uh, and then you took the librarian position as head of the Division of Asian Collections. Now, you're credited within five years. Uh, with establishing a whole new culture in the division, a culture of cooperation. You're credited with reorganizing and restructuring the whole division. You're credited with building the collection at a rate that it had not been through. You're credited with, in fact, there were stacks of books in the shelves. Uh, that had never been cataloged. You credited with bringing all that into the active library uh, cataloging. You're credited with a great many things uh, in the course of five short years. I have, I guess, two questions. <laughs> Why in the world did you take this on at that <laughs> point in your life? And secondly, uh, what do you regard as your most important contribution? Yeah, at the Library of Congress, they actually asked me three times. I rejected the first time, I just turned it down because I, didn't, I knew the problem was so serious. And also working, get used to a environment, college, university environment. I can foresee the difficulty working in the government very bureaucratic kind of organization with three unions I had to deal with, plus all the other red tapes. <laughs> so, but the third time when it came around, I couldn't say no. And then I, they really, I, I feel that I am the person. If there's a challenge there, I think it was hard for me to try. So I told Mary, Mary, I think there's something I really cannot say no now. So we moved to Washington, D.C. for a few years. She said, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to Washington, D.C. by myself for the first year, and then Mary came the second year. And it was a very difficult time. But very fortunate, again, I have good support from the librarian, Dr. James Billington. I have a support from Diana Markham, the associate librarian. But most important of all, my staff, my colleagues, they all want the Asian division to be recognized, to be respected, but they need the kind of leadership. And I happen to be available at the time, so I had to work very, very hard. I got there 7 o'clock in the morning. I don't leave until 9 o'clock <laughs> in the evening, including weekends. But they do pay off because I see things change very, very rapidly. Once you want to do something, everybody felt that's the right thing to do. Everybody chip in. And then later on, I have so many help, good help, volunteers from the community.
They said, we want to do volunteer. We're coming to work for you. We have about 10, 15 volunteers every day. Those are the force contribute to the success of my short tenure at the Ohio at the Library of Congress. And you also established uh, fundraising uh, <laughs> activity. Then there were some uh, familiar names on that list. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I, as usual, I took up too much more, much more time. But I'm assuming that not many people have had a chance to read the book. Uh, <laughs> and there will be lots of questions that will come from reading it. Uh, puzzlements about how you were able to do things. But uh, Scott, I'm willing to shut up if you want me to shut up. I, I, just, want to, I just want to add a thing. Talking about fundraising, I didn't know anything about fundraising. fundraising. But eventually, I wrote a book about it. I had to give credit to one person sitting behind, Jack Ellis, <laughs> the vice president for development, and my good neighbor. Every time I have a problem, I go to Jack, I lock his door. I mean, Jack, I have some problems. I don't know whether I can do it or not. Jack always very positive. He said, Huawei, you do it, I'll pick you up. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, all my success, I had to give credit to Jack. He was the one taught me, care, uh, carry my hand, walked through the very difficult task. But we, we did very well. I really appreciate it. Well, you had a great <laughs> teacher. <laughs> Good teacher. Yeah. Well, I don't want to break this conversation up, but I do want to give the audience an opportunity to ask some questions. And for that, I'd like to also invite Yang Yang and Ying Ying Zhang. Uh, there are some chairs. If you'd be willing to uh, entertain a few questions too, please. Thank you. While they're getting that settled, I'll, um, I'll give one quick story. Um, Charlie and Huawei both mentioned OCLC. You may not, that may not be a phrase that you're familiar with, but if you're a scholar in this room, you may have used something called WorldCat. And WorldCat is a collective database of all the world's books. Today, it's international, it's worldwide. It contains over two billion, two billion with a B, bibliographic records. What you might not know is that bibliographic record number one was from Ohio University, and it was from this building. It is an extraordinary legacy that this library uh, has imparted upon scholarship. And it was Huawei who really took the OCLC system. He inherited this from a, a, the previous director, um, Thompson Little, and made it work. And it worked here first. So um, with that, I would like to open uh, open the audience, uh, open up for questions, please. Where do you live now, now? Jacksonville, Florida, sunny Florida. Maps, um, yeah. films, all kinds of, yeah. And how do they, how do you, and are there, do you get to, like, if you're able to do, do you get to control it all, or is there a photographic section, or is there just a um, kind of a tough situation of the port preservation right. issues? The library come with many, many divisions. So they have a very good division of labor. For example, the, Asian division take care of the print materials and digital materials. And then the films, they have a film department, map, have map department, but we coordinate all the services about Asia. Because in fact, our staff will go to other divisions where they have the Asian materials. We help them answering questions, helping them organizing their materials, and uh, also we help to publicize those materials. We're asking, 
Yang Yang say something? Well, actually, I have a question for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, the Pittsburgh, you know, Pittsburgh? No, I'm in China. In China. I'm fortunate that after I, my retirement here, and that program stopped. But now, Scott, the thing Seaman, actually everything a lot of different way. It's, it's an internship training program, but in different kind of format. So, Yang Yang, my question um, is that I happen to know you're a documentary filmmaker by profession for uh, Central Chinese Television. Was this your first biography that you wrote, and how is it different or how is it the same from doing documentary film? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is uh, the first group. Uh, yeah, well. speaker. Well, maybe I can I go over there. Okay. Yes, please. Okay. is the, the, the first book I, I wrote. And um, I think um, I also wrote it in, a, uh, write it in a, a documentary way. So it's also a, a, a documentary, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I've done a lot of uh, interviews with my uh, characters in, uh, in other documentaries. It's just Dr. Lee's uh, interviews are very, very long interviews. <laughs> <laughs> so every time he, um, uh, he traveled to China, I would do interviews uh, like um, two or three days each time, right? So uh, it's a very, very long um, interviews. But I found it very, very happy. And uh, it's a wonderful experience because uh, while writing the book, I, I can um, how do I s describe it? It's, um, I can see his, the richness of uh, his life and the wisdom that in, in addition to, to his um, um, library uh, achievements. So I enjoy it very much. I think uh, Dr. Lee is uh, um, a legendary character of my documentary. <laughs> <laughs> recording of all the interviews. Uh, so I'm doing this documentary by words, not by camera. Yeah, it's just uh, the character about uh, Dr. Lee's uh, elder brother. Yeah, uh, I think there are some uh, sensitive things. Um, so by the time uh, I send the, uh, the writing to my editor, and they think uh, uh, it's nice uh, if uh, they can take, take that, because, uh, well, that's uh, a little bit political, right? <laughs> <laughs> But it's good. Um, in uh, Taiwan, they publish everything because uh, that character is also one of uh, my favorites. I spend a lot of time doing research, you know, read all the books because that's the history. And that's uh, and uh, also uh, Dr. Lee's elder brother is uh, um, very important. Um, you're very close to your brother. Any questions? Yeah, a couple over here. I'd just like to tell a story. Um, Dr. Lee and I have served as like an honorary. Dr. Lee and I have set, uh, sat on a, a was involved in an organization that did college education. Um, it was an honorary society. So I knew for about a five year period we were in these meetings all the time. So I have several relatives that have come through Harlem Police Station. I had one. She was Stephanie. Get together, so we start talking about it. And I, you know, I, well, 
I, I saw him on campus one day and I said, That Stephanie have her come in. <laughs> and she we would talk about that with stuff that she meant in she worked in the library for two years for the staff of that. <laughs> I got a good people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, another there, there, there one this one. Thank you. In his book on fundraising, the first principle is relation. We had a question here. Yes. Yeah, um, I learned this term when I came back as freshman year in the uh, PC public book of Division and some red line. Um, so uh, among Asian uh, communities, Asian American communities here in the Bay, people often talk about the term of black seeing. That is, um, as the first generation of immigrants, we cannot reach a, a certain level. Uh, we can we wait, but then we cannot get to a high, certain limit that uh, uh, we assume. So we came to this country 60 years ago, more than 60 years ago. So for me, and uh, according to this story, I think this black scene didn't exist. <laughs> so in what way uh, you were capable of thinking of the so-called black scene? And of course, uh, Yes. Oh, Jack. Yes, in the back. Uh, in addition to the financial question of how to pay for education, uh, I've gone away with a uh, ten years of actual public service. Each time I had breakfast with with these guys and some of the guys that were running, I was reminded of my experience as a person who grew up right next door, which speaks to his ability of <laughs> and uh, while they would be purple tag, it was great to think that after the second day of getting out of the bill by helping them with their laundry, the fellow who was back there, he was about telling me, Jack, that when you tell your stories, I would tell the audience that first of all, let's just get something funny, please laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, uh. 
Well, I, I would like to, oh, Shimo Wang, a colleague of mine from the University of Cincinnati has a question. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations to Mei Ming about all of this. My question actually is for the translator. I want to know um, what motivated you to translate this book, which you translate first. You what motivated you and what are the stories you share over the translation and working with the Huawei and the working with the CNA? It was a uh, it is a good question. So my answer to your question is that uh, the motivation comes uh, starting from my personal contacts with Dr. Li. And I, I was here 17 years ago as uh, an intern, uh, training here under the International Library Librarian Internship Program. I was from uh, Zhongshan University, Sun Yat-sen University, China. And, uh, uh, Dr. Li, before I came here, I said, well, I, if I want to work at the university library, I need to do learn something before I can work. I feel like I'm not competent enough to work. So Dr. Li was c so kind, give me a uh, set up, a, uh, allow me to set up a customized plan. So I went to Kent State first for three months and then come here for another three months. So I was so, it was so rewarding experience. S uh, and then later I encountered with Dr. Liu several times at the workshops, conferences, or library visit. So I feel like uh, Dr. Liu is not only to me uh, uh, a mentor in my librarianship, but also a personal life. I because I met, got to meet, learn, uh, I was married. So, uh, and uh, uh, I feel like uh, Okay, how could I say? So he's my mentor and uh, pusher during my <laughs> difficult <laughs> years. <laughs> uh, and uh, I went back to China, worked two years, and then came back to get my PhD in library information science from Rutgers, New Jersey, and then worked at you. So all these experience, I always ask uh, Dr. Li for advice. So when Yang Yang's book came out, I couldn't wait to read about because I, the, my previous contact with him is just uh, from professional. But I would like to learn more about him, what behind him, who, uh, which can make him uh, that perfect person to me. So I couldn't w wait to read. Uh, I took uh, maybe a couple of days to go through all the, read through all the biography, the, the, this con the Chinese version. So I called Dr. Lee, I said, wow, this is a well-written, well-documented, I learned so much, and I hope your wife, Mary, and all your, all your kids and the grandkids could learn. But unfortunately, he said, oh yeah, they could read the Chinese. <laughs> I said, okay, I, if I, I have time, I could uh, try to, although I, this is, again, my first book length translation from uh, uh, the, my, native language uh, to a second language, it's very hard. I'm not a literature <laughs> person. So, but uh, I said, I will be learn uh, learning to do that. And also, I didn't, at that time, I didn't think about this will be become a published book. I thought it's just a fi family archive <laughs> something. <you know? laughs> so, uh, Dr. Lee, again, was very, very <laughs> encouraging, you know. He, he, he said, okay, well, do it. I said, uh, okay. Uh, my English is not still second language. He said, oh, no problem, Mary and Bob. I said, thank you so much. And uh, they were, it turned out every, uh, many other people at the OU also helped me to do proofreading. So through this uh, translation project, I learned a lot, not, the, not only about the spirit of librarianship and the leadership of Dr. Huawei, and also her, his rich life. To me, I think, and also yesterday I was thinking about, because the combination of uh, yin and yang in the or <laughs> authorship <laughs> and the uh, translator is a perfect match, uh, like uh, uh, reflecting Dr. Lee's uh, rich life, which is a perfect ma match to the yin-yang law of utility. <laughs> so I think uh, uh, what a coincidence here. <laughs> Thank you. Yes.
Chinese yes. To Chinese. Chinese to English. Chinese That's English. the challenging That's part. Yeah. But the difference between you one and I, how was Dr. Lee's Chinese <laughs> ability? <laughs> <laughs> He, that's his uh, native language <laughs> too. Oh yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. The Dr. Lee has been in uh, the state in uh, in English world for, for sixty for years. Yeah, such a long time. So yeah. I was wondering, it's amazing. You you knew he trained uh, Chinese la native language. Yeah. Still quite a bit. For my Chinese. twenty first twenty years, I didn't use much Chinese because I wanted to learn English. I see. And then after. The 20 years, I started to try to make connection with the Chinese library with the internship programs. I began, mm -hmm. again, to relearn some of my Chinese. So I think my Chinese is possible, not as good as it, the, the people from China right now. But when you wrote the book, you wrote, oh, I'm sorry, you wrote the book. I see the book. He wrote it, yeah. You wrote the book. <laughs> Well, please join me in thanking Dr. Huawei Lee, <laughs> President Emeritus King, of course, for doing the interview, Yang Yang and Ying Zhang. <laughs> Once again, Little Professor is here with copies of the book to sell, if you would like. There is a reception on the third floor in the Faculty Commons, and Huawei has agreed to do some book signings. So. Thank you again for coming. <laughs> 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 How are you doing?